So tēnā koutou katoa, um, greetings to the latest Genomics Aotearoa um, video seminar series. Uh, I am not Peter Dearden, I'm Professor Neil Gemmell and I'm uh, standing in for Peter uh, to introduce my very good colleague Professor Lisa Matuso-Smith who is giving today's uh, lecture. Um, Lisa, as many of you will probably know, is an eminent bioanthropologist uh, who works in the Department of Anatomy at the University of Otago. She has made seminal contributions to our understanding of Pacific uh, prehistory, um, particularly using uh, information on commensal organisms uh, like rats, uh, but also studying the Pacific peoples themselves, both using contemporary and historic materials. And today she's going to be giving a lecture that is going to illustrate the importance of uh, looking back to go forwards, I think is hip. Uh, so Kamua, Kamuri, why understanding the Pacific past is important for Pacific genomic research today. Lisa, over to you. Kia ora, Neil, e mihi nui ki a koutou. Um, ko Sur Munamagi, uh, te maunga o o kutupuna, ko uh, te repo repo o vasalina, te wai o o kutupuna, uh, ko Andres Marisu to kumatua no Estonia ia. Uh, no engarangi me kotorangi me weru o kutupuna ki te taha toku mama. Uh, ko Julia Merrill Morris toku faia no America ia. Ko Brent Smith takutane no Tamaki Makauro ia. Uh, ko Lisa Madison Smith toku ingoa. Uh, I i fano mai uh, ki, te ma, uh, ki te motu o wahu. Uh, Hawaii, engari i tipuahau ki te maru maru o Maunga Fuji. Uh, e noho ana ahau uh, i Aotearoa mō tau uh, rua takau marima nō rera uh, te moana nui a kiwa ki roto uh, tōku ngākau, uh, tōku koiwi <laughs> me uh, Toku wairua. Uh, no rera tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So, <laughs> most of you will um, have probably picked up that uh, I just uh, gave you uh, both a, uh, a, a welcome, but um, also my pepeha. And to a certain extent, um, that is the point of this whole talk. So, um, translated, <laughs> um, my uh, the, my ancestors um, come from Estonia. The the manga um, is um, Surmunamagi, the the um, the only mountain. It's really a puke. It's really not a mountain, but a hill in in Estonia. Um, so that's easy. Uh, and um, the the wetlands, the Repo Repo of Vaselina, which is the town where my father is from. Um, is the why of, of my ancestors that uh, Estonia is a land of swamps or wetlands and they love their wetlands and so it's very much the same situation. So my father Andres Matasu is from Estonia. Um, my mother, uh, my mother <coughs> is, is from England, Scotland and Wales um, and we're on the first boats that went over to the Americas. So my mother Julia Merle Morris um, is, uh, is from America from the United States. I married Brent Smith, um, who is a Tamaki Makauro, uh, Mangri Bridge boy. Um, and my name is Lisa Marasu Smith. I was uh, born on Oahu in Hawaii, and I grew up in Japan. Uh, but I have lived here in Aotearoa now for 35 years. Um, so the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific region is literally in my heart, uh, Japan, uh, Hawaii, uh, New Zealand, um, it is literally biochemically, <laughs> it is in my bones. Um, the, the regions that I grew up with in um, are reflected uh, in, in my bones and it is in my, um, in my soul. I love the Pacific Ocean, um, but the Pacific is not in my DNA. So that's the story. So you can, uh, you, take, you, can, you can now just relax and, <laughs> and tune out or, uh, um, or carry on. If, if you want to hear a bit of that story. So um, basically, let me see if I can get this out of the way here. Um, is that better? Can Neil, is that 
don't know if you guys can see the, the slides fully now. Um, All good. Okay. So as Neil said, I am a biological anthropologist. Um, and what we do, which a lot of people don't know, is basically um, from a uh, biocultural perspective, um, understanding and explaining human variation. Um, so this is a slide I show during my first year class. You know, it relates to our origins. Where do we come from? What is the, the kind of genetic template, I suppose, that we're working from? Um, what kind of environments? Um, how, how they contribute to human variation, um, environmental stress, how we deal with it, um, what we eat, how much food we get, uh, how is that changed through time, the various cultural traits that have an impact on our biology, um, what we wear, who we marry, you know, what kind of activities do we do, what was our role or status in the group and how that has an impact on our biology. And of course, understanding in interactions, migrations and exchange and so forth. So um, it's it's a pretty exciting, uh, whoop, why am I not? There we go. Um, it's a pretty exciting field to be in, uh, especially for somebody who loves both the arts and the sciences, but it's also quite important um, in understanding uh, human health, for example. Um, and when it goes wrong, when we don't actually um, engage fully um, with all of those um, factors in understanding human variation, it can have some pretty negative um, impacts. So the classic, you know, um, milk movement uh, by the dairy industry and milk is good for you and drink milk and everybody, including, you know, you drink milk, you can look like Angelina Jolie uh, or be an Olympic athlete. Um, but of course, um, this had some serious uh, impacts. Uh, those of us who were alive in the 60s and 70s might remember the, you know, um, pleas uh, for what are we going to do to try to address, you know, the starving children of Biafra uh, or Southeast Asia. Um, and of course, the response uh, of, from the West was to send them milk or milk powder. Um, and that was doing our good deed. We were going to help them. But of course, this caused a number of different problems because of the inability of those people, many of those people to um, be able to break down, break down uh, lactose. And so um, we were really adding to the problem rather than solving the problem. Because um, as we now know, thanks to genetics, um, and, and again, a classic um, introduction to biological anthropology slide and discussion here, uh, lactose tolerance uh, evolved. It's a classic uh, co-evolution of genes and culture, um, and it evolved multiple times um, in multiple locations, uh, and but is still um, not the predominant state uh, amongst humans. Um, and so while we do realize that there's some irony of having a Southeast Asian uh, actor promoting um, milk drinking, um, and despite the fact that we know about the co-evolution um, and the distribution of lactose tolerance, um, we still have some pretty silly um, people making, making um, some inappropriate kind of suggestions. So, and it can do harm. Um, so getting back to history and getting back to um, the Pacific, uh, historically, this is the way that the Western um, scientific community um, described and explained um, the Pacific initially. And, um, and of course, this was based on um, racist um, typological thinking in many cases um, in these kind of early attempts to understand and explain uh, human biological and linguistic and cultural variation in the Pacific. Um, but it still, of course, um, impacts our view um, of the Pacific today, despite the fact that for decades, um, we have been arguing that, that this is problematic from a biological perspective. Um, and from a cultural perspective and from a linguistic perspective. But these are the terms that most people think of and are aware of and picture um, when they're thinking about the Pacific and Pacific populations. Um, but uh, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense that we think about um, the, again, these basic biological concepts um, that are contributing to variation, population origins, uh, adaptations, and so forth. So, of course, um, in the Pacific, we have uh, incredibly diverse populations um, that are a result of some of the earliest out of Africa migrations, the populations um, that uh, left uh, 
Africa 65, 70,000 years ago or so, um, and made their way through down into the Pacific region, um, uh, what is now New Guinea, Australia, Tasmania, um, and then of course the Pacific um, is also in terms of history, um, the result of uh, one of the last, the last major migration um, into known, into previously um, uninhabited lands with the expansion um, into remote Oceania, uh, which really began probably up here around 5,000 years ago in, in Taiwan um, and ultimately resulted in the settlement of Polynesia just in the last thousand or 1500 years. So diverse uh, history, diverse environments, um, and uh, complicated, complex history. Just very quickly, um, again, keeping in mind, we have to understand that the landscape uh, when people first entered this, this region um, was quite different than it is today, and it has continued to change, and as we know, is still changing and having an impact on, on people and their uh, lives, their biology, their interactions, their health. Um, but uh, this is what the landscape looked like until the Holocene, um, so until about 11, 11 and a half thousand years ago, people could walk from, from Africa through what is now um, island Southeast Asia or Sundaland, um, but they needed some form of watercraft in order to get across to the greater land mass of Sahul. Um, and this, this watercraft um, required crossing more than um, minimum uh, of more than 70 kilometers in order to get um, from Sunda to, to Sahul, ga water gaps of a minimum of 70 kilometers. So watercraft was important for the very initial um, occupation of, of the Pacific, um, and it continues to be an important feature um, of, of Pacific um, history. Uh, the earliest dates that we have for the arrival in Sahul, um, archaeologically, with some debate, um, date to about 60 to 65,000 years ago um, in what is now Australia, the site of Majibebe. Um, and, um, and we have evidence of human uh, presence in um, New Guinea by it, by at least 50,000 years ago. So um, evidence indicates that there was, uh, was not a single uh, crossing or would have been probably multiple crossings and in several um, hundreds of individuals who, who were involved in this initial settling um, that, in order to explain the diversity that we see uh, in the region today. So we see significant genetic diversity, but also significant linguistic diversity, which is, um, of course, the result of that deep time depth and um, isolation, geographic isolation, social isolation, um, relative uh, isolation, uh, not completely isolated, but relative uh, isolation uh, for tens of thousands of years. So this initial um, occupation um, region and timing um, of occupation, um, we're, we're saying at least 60,000 years ago, um, 50,000 years ago in New Guinea, and by 30,000 years ago, people got through to the Solomon Islands and the islands of Bismarck Archipelago, again, requiring some form of watercraft. Um, this area we tend to refer to as near Oceania, this deep er this region of deep history um, and, and shared but distinct um, ancestry of those populations um, being, as I say, this is all happening before, certainly Australia, New Guinea, before modern humans are in, um, in Europe, uh, as I say, reaching the Solomon Islands by 30,000 years ago. This separate, is separated from remote Oceania, which was the last uh, region that was settled by humans. And as I say, this began probably up in island Southeast Asia 5,000 years ago, um, and people arrived uh, in the islands of near Oceania uh, about three and a half thousand years ago, and about 3,000 years ago, kind of crossed this barrier between what we refer to as near and remote Oceania. Now, this expansion into remote Oceania um, and, and, and the arrival of these new people into near Oceania is associated with, linguistically with what we call the Austronesian expansion. Um, and this is a, a group of, of people speaking a shared language family, unlike the languages of, of New Guinea, um, they do belong to a single language family. Um, and we believe it began around five, 6,000 BP or years before present, is how archeologists and prehistorians refer to uh, BP. Um, and um, 
that was probably the result of a Neolithic expansion. So um, during the Neolithic, the domestication of plants and animals um, generally resulted in more sedentary populations and a population boom. Um, and we think that it is that growth of population that drove the movement of people both into Taiwan and, and then out of Taiwan through the Philippines, um, beginning you know, about 4,000, 3,500 years ago. And we see the, the archaeological evidence of this Austronesian expansion um, moving out into the Pacific uh, between 3,500 uh, BP and about 3,350 BP arriving in the Bismarck Archipelago. I'm sorry. So when we look at the languages of the Pacific, we can see that, um, as we say, Taiwan is believed to be the homeland. That's the, the area of most genetic diversity within the Austronesian languages. And it is one branch of nine that the um, Malayo-Polynesian branch that we see is, is incredibly um, widespread, one of the most widespread language families in the world. Um, and we see that uh, people are speaking Austronesian languages as far as um, West is Madagascar and as far east as Easter Island. And you can see here in yellow that the languages, most of the languages of the Pacific and certainly those of most of those of remote Oceania belong to the oceanic subgroup of Austronesian languages. So the whole Taiwan origins that many people have heard about um, for Polynesian or Lapita origins is based on linguistic evidence. The languages trace back to Taiwan. The DNA traces back to either near Oceania or the islands um, of island Southeast Asia, um, but we don't actually see the, um, the, the exact same lineages uh, in Taiwan. And when we're talking about Taiwan, we're talking about Taiwanese Aboriginal um, populations. So uh, there was a huge Han Chinese expansion um, that swamped really the, the indigenous um, peoples of, of Taiwan. So archaeologically, we see this Austronesian expansion, at least in the Pacific, is associated with what we call um, the Lapita culture, the Lapita cultural complex, um, which again, um, is say language, culture, and biology um, often get interpreted as being kind of a package. Um, but uh, if you think about language and culture and biology today, you would realize that um, that is certainly not always the case. Um, but we do see uh, archeologically an appearance of a, a new culture um, in the Bismarck Archipelago and say in these, these sites about 3,350 years ago. Um, and then we see kind of an almost uh, instantaneous, archeologically instantaneous expansion um, out into um, uh, Central and Western Pacific. So Lapita sites first appear in the Bismarck Archipelago. We don't see Lapita sites before that. We see some components of the Lapita cultural complex in island Southeast Asia, but as we recognize it archeologically, it first appears in the Bismarck Archipelago. And what we see is, as these Lapita people spread across um, the Pacific, we see the appearance of, of um, some Southeast Asian components, um, particularly the animals, the pigs, chickens, rats, and, and possibly dogs, um, but also uh, the incorporation of many of the near oceanic uh, plant foods in the Lapita culture. Um, and uh, as was noted in the, the previous slide, actually there, the transported landscapes, the people carrying these plants and animals was really an important component of um, the Lapita expansion. And we think part of um, the, the success and the speed um, of the Lapita expansion is tied into this mobility and these transported landscapes, these people carrying their plants and their animals and the things that are culturally important to them um, with them in their colonizing canoes. It's most archeologically identifiable Lapita um, because we see this is a, a new distinct characteristic by the pottery that appears in the archeological sites. So we don't see pottery in New Guinea um, in the Bismarck archipelago prior to Lapita. Um, but so we see this evidence pottery is also a classic Neolithic uh, item, um, but it's the distinctive design motifs and the shapes of the pots that really identify um, Lapita pottery and make it different from the pottery that we see in island Southeast Asia and even in the, the Marianas Islands um, uh, that were settled just, or the dates of which are, are 
slightly earlier, 100, 200 years earlier than Lapita. But it's not just pottery, it's, it's a range of artifacts, um, shell artifacts, uh, jewelry, fish hooks, shell adzes, um, stone that gets um, traded, in particular obsidian or volcanic glass, um, that gets traded throughout the Lapita network. But we also see these kind of this Neolithic, uh, again, another marker, village settlements um, of people living in in small hamlets, um, in stilt houses, generally built out over the reef. So these are maritime people. Um, and they, there are some interesting biological arguments as to why they were living um, out over the reef flats, not just access for their boats and so forth, but also potentially um, avoiding mosquitoes and, and therefore malaria. Um, but uh, those are those are some of the characteristics that we see in the archaeological record. And as I say, that it's almost instantaneous archaeologically. We see these Lapita sites on um, the islands of the Bismarck Archipelago, and particularly the offshore islands of the Bismarck Archipelago, through parts um, of, of the Solomon Islands. But some interesting missing you know, lack of Lapita sites in parts of the Solomons. Eventually, late Lapita does come around to the south coast of New Guinea. But these early Lapita um, trajectory seems to be through the islands. Um, reaching the reef Santa Cruz, which are the, the first islands in remote Oceania. So these are the first islands where the Lapita people uh, are the first people to arrive. And we see that um, happening about 3,000, 3,100 years ago. Um, same dates for, for settlement of Vanuatu in, in New Caledonia, and virtually the same dates, 2,900 for settlement of, of Tonga, and just slightly 50 years perhaps later in Samoa, where we have an ephemeral um, Lapita presence. It doesn't, um, very strong Lapita signature in Tonga, not so much in, in Samoa, but as I say, archaeologically instantaneous and crossing them that Melanesia-Polynesia divide. Lapita expansion stops there in Samoa and Tonga on the edge of the Polynesian Triangle. Now, reconstructions of Proto-Oceanic languages, um, or the reconstructions of the Proto-Oceanic language, um, indicate uh, these are definitely maritime people. We certainly see that in the in the way that they're settling, but also in their terminology for canoes, for canoe parts, um, or concepts associated with canoes. And so we think that um, in order to get out into remote Oceania, it required a new form of watercraft. We think it was probably rafting that allowed people to get across from Sunda to Sahul, you know, 60,000 years ago, um, that the Bismarck Archipelago was in a sense, it's been argued, a, a voyaging nursery where people were learning um, the environment, learning how to sail. But we see with Lapita, um, it looks like the, the arrival of new sailing technology, which was the outrigger canoe, um, along with a number of different sail types that allowed people to sail quite um, confidently and comfortably um, into the wind, uh, which is was very critical for, for sailing out into remote Oceania. So to move into remote Oceania, you're actually moving into a region where the islands are not intervisible. While people are sailing in, in near Oceania, in the Bismarck Archipelago, and through the Solomon Islands, so are high islands, the distances are not so great, so you never lose sight of land. Um, with few exceptions, getting out to Manus, uh, which people did 20,000 years ago um, in the Admiralty Islands requires out of uh, sight sailing. But for the most part, you're sailing uh, before you lose sight of the place, the land that you left, you can see the island that you're going to. So a major kind of psychological barrier um, sailing out of sight of land. And that's why we think that's what we think separated the near remote Oceania history, settlement history by such a significant amount of time. So another question people always ask me is why didn't people, Lapita people get to Australia? Again, if you're looking at the predominant winds and currents and so forth, and the island um, arcs that we see, you see there's a continuous kind of um, group of islands uh, in a reliable sailing environment. Sailing north and south is much more dangerous, um, much less reliable, particularly for return voyaging, which was um, clearly an important um, process that the Lapita people um, utilized in order to successfully settle um, remote Oceania. So we think if um, sailing 
basically into the wind in this direction. People would, and we certainly see this from the archeological evidence um, that people sailed out a particular distance uh, until they found land, then they would turn around, sail with the wind back to their, their point of starting. If they didn't find land in that voyage, they would go out as either a slightly different angle or slightly longer um, until, they, they, until they found land, would go back, and then they knew where they were going to when they actually loaded up their canoes with this transported landscape, with their people, their plants, their animals, uh, the things that they wanted to take and needed to take to the next island. So um, we can see that it very quickly, it fits um, this kind of uh, a strategy um, for voyaging when we look at the, the evidence for um, the dates of, of settlement and the speed in which um, that occurred. So what's really important in the, all of this is that um, if you're sailing into remote Oceania, ultimately into Polynesia, people didn't know that they were going to Polynesia as any particular place, but they just knew that there was always another island out there. That history, that knowledge was there. This uh, expansion was rapid. It was safe. People, were not, people didn't have a death wish. People don't generally do that today. They go off in a, in a very safe um, process of scanning the Pacific, scanning the land, the seascape, um, and then return voyaging. So there's little or no loss of life. Um, people know how to get home. They know how long it's going to take them. It's easier to get home. Um, they, they, uh, and we have a difference again between exploration. Generally, your men, and there's some debate about this now, um, are out, out doing the exploring. Um, then they come back and they take uh, women, children, and, and other people, the, not the explorers, but the settlers with them um, when they uh, set now sail to a known location um, with, the, with those colonists. So say Lapita expansion got as far um, as Samoa and Tonga, and they stopped there. Again, some interesting debates about why that might have happened, um, but it was another 2,000 years before the, the final burst, um, final kind of pulse of expansion occurred, um, which resulted in the settlement of Central central East Polynesia and the extremes of Hawaii by about 1,200 years ago, out to Rapa Nui, uh, about the same time, 750, 800 years BP to Rapa Nui, um, as, as we have settlement here of Aotearoa, about 730, 750 uh, BP, late 13th, early 14th century, if you want to take it that way. So as I say, you can see the settlement of the Pacific is a series of kind of pulses of population movement. It's, it's incredibly complex. We've got these, you know, this deep history and this, this extreme kind of genetic variation in terms of the settlement of near Oceania. Um, and then this kind of much more recent um, expansion into remote Oceania and Polynesia. But we have evidence of, of interactions uh, throughout this region. Um, and over these, these periods of time. These are people who, they're oceanic people. They are maritime people. Um, they, you know, the ocean is their highway. Um, and the Western perspective is that the ocean is ba a barrier and is dangerous. Um, and, uh, and that the concept has always been, these are isolated populations. Partly because, you know, it's, it's an incredible area that, that these people settled. This is, this is a map of, of French Polynesia, and I love this. It's from Air Tahiti Nui. Um, this is French Polynesia overlaying on a map of, of Europe. And just to give people, you know, Europeans think in, in you know, their landscape, um, you can see that it extends from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean and from, you know, the Iberian Peninsula through all of Western Europe, basically. Now that on this map is just French Polynesia, which is in that red circle there. So, you know, the distances that these people traveled um, were truly uh, amazing. These were highly skilled um, navigators and sailors. One of the things that we see, again, linguistically um, and archeologically uh, that we think may be associated with this final pulse out into Central East Polynesia was the appearance um, of the double-hulled voyaging canoe, which um, again, more um, uh, allowed it is more stable and, and allowed people to travel longer distances um, and potentially more difficult um, sailing routes uh, north to Hawaii and, and south to Aotearoa. Um, but what we see in the settlement uh, uh, in the archeological record in Polynesia is that 
um, these long distance trade and exchange, net, exchange networks um, continued similar to those that we saw with Lapita and the exchange of, of obsidian through uh, the Lapita network. We see trade and exchange of stone tools, in particular basalts, um, which were important for making adzes and, and other tools um, being traded. And we can track them um, geochemically. Um, so we can see that they're being moved out of um, the society islands of this kind of homeland region of central uh, East Polynesia up um, to Hawaii. And we're seeing, seeing movement of, of stone tools and, and other um, factors here. So the, again, not isolated people. We also see this in, in the settlement history here of Aotearoa and looking at the archeological and the genetic evidence um, from sites like Muarabar, Te Pokuhiwi Akupe, which is one of the oldest and now best dated archeological sites uh, in New Zealand and in the Pacific. Um, and it also includes the largest sample of burials um, in Aotearoa and one of the largest um, burial populations um, in Polynesia. So a lot of what we know genetically um, about, about uh, the first colonists um, and, and ancient East Polynesians is from um, uh, the work at, at Wairabar and the, the Tupuna from Wairabar. What we see from the archeology span of the sites is one of the earliest sites, it is not the earliest. And we see a number of large um, archeological sites located in really strategic locations throughout uh, the Motu. And again, this shows us this, this whole um, concept of strategic settlement um, where people are settling um, you know, in, in, in prime locations. Warabar is just located right here. You've got access to both the North Island and the South Island, both East and West coasts, access to the rivers. Um, you've got horticultural zone uh, in where sweet potato or kumara can be grown, um, access to the argillites, the really beautiful stone. Um, uh, that we see here in, in the Marlborough Sounds, um, access to greenstone, um, access to moa hunting, uh, and all of this is being moved around and traded. So strategically located positions for people to come together, we think, uh, and, um, and we see evidence of this trade and exchange. We've also, I'm working with Rangatane, um, have, have undertaken genomic studies of the people, the, the Tupuna from Wairabar, um, we now uh, see um, a significant amount of mitochondrial DNA variation in these people who were among the first arrivals um, in Aotearoa. We have at least uh, 12 maternal lineages from the Tupuna, um, closely related lineages, but distinct maternal lineages, which means that this is not a single family or a single a group of closely related people maternally um, who were part of this, this founding population. Um, and when we look at the mitochondrial DNA, for example, today, that what we see in a number of different studies is that there is significant mitochondrial variation. So we're talking, there would have been hundreds, if not thousands of um, uh, people required in order to explain the variation that we see. So combined with the archeology, span we see that colonization of Aotearoa was sudden, uh, instantaneous dispersal, they had completely um, sailed around the Motu and understood um, what the resources were available and how to utilize them and trade and exchange, extremely efficient exploration and the establishment of several surprisingly big, rich, um, diverse settlements um, like White Abar, but there are several. So this um, changes our, our kind of um, understanding of the process of population growth. Um, some of the early models really, you know, having this kind of Western concept of, of starving people and, and canoes, a small, you know, canoe arrived by chance on the shores and grew slowly over a period of time um, to represent the population at the time of European arrival, where we now know it was much more likely a mass migration, a large number of people migrating to Aotearoa, who arrived over a very short period of time beginning uh, in the 14th century. Um, the homeland we can identify through a number of, of processes um, is clearly in what we refer to as the Hawaii key zone. Um, a number of, of archipelagos, um, societies, cooks, australs perhaps, um, that we can trace uh, people animals, plants, uh, all back to this Hawaii zone. And of course, oral traditions tell us this as well. 
So what we know is that this is an inaccurate depiction of the colonization event um, that, uh, you know, very, very different reality um, for the settlement of the Pacific. Now, we've known this, um, Pacific people have known this, have understood the, the, the um, nature of, of voyaging um, and of the reliability of it, uh, of where origins, uh, Pacific origins are and so forth. Um, I've known it for, for centuries. Um, archaeologists and linguists and biological anthropologists have been kind of um, studying this for, for decades and, and kind of uh, reconstructing this, this process. But it doesn't seem to be getting through, um, particularly amongst geneticists, but the key issues in Pacific history that do have significant biological uh, implications, of course, are that there's a complexity or multiple phases, of pulses of settlement, um, significant, uh, more genetic diversity than many people have thought. How much is something we're still trying to get our heads around? Um, safe and systematic settlement and voyaging means little or no loss of life, two-way long distance trade and exchange networks means that people are exchanging not only stone resources, but also partners, um, biologically exchanging genes. These are not isolated populations or single canoe loads of settlers. Um, there's another interesting debate, which is a whole other talk about continuity and replacement, but we certainly have to ask ourselves, how well do the populations we see today reflect the populations of the past? And so we have to engage with this prehistory or else we're gonna do some pretty silly things, which we seem to be doing. Um, so what are the biological or genomic implications of not engaging? Uh, genomic, you know, it certainly has, has um, an impact on the way that we uh, are structuring our genomic reconstructions of, of origins and interactions and demography, but also explanations for health disparity. So very quickly, um, going to give you a classic recent example of this uh, paper that came out last year in September about um, uh, reconstructing the, the paths and timing of settlement based on, on genomic networks. Of course, the archaeologists and linguists and, and uh, many um, biological anthropologists have been, have, have been reconstructing this uh, for, as I say, for decades, but uh, we now can apply genomic data and answer these long asked questions. Um, so um, this is the abstract from that paper, um, talking about the importance of, you know, the incredible extraordinary voyages of Polynesians, um, but creating a scenario where, you know, we don't know about the timing and, and the sequence of settlement, but we actually kind of do. Uh, we have very good radiocarbon dating, but here using genome-wide data from 430 modern individuals from 21 key Pacific Island and Island Southeast Asia locations um, and some really exciting new computation, computational analyses, we unraveled the detailed genetic history, um, which shows a serial, uh, serial founder expansion um, characterized by directional loss of variants. Um, and so they have reconstructed um, this whole process, Yonidus et al. Um, here we can see their PCAs um, showing um, separation of, of West Polynesia, Tonga, Samoa, and Fiji from East Polynesia. Interestingly, the uh, island Southeast Asians are kind of in between, but that's not really dealt with. We see the extremes of Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, and Rapa Iti, um, Rapa in the, in the Austral group. But then we see this kind of major uh, cluster of, of central East Polynesian uh, populations from the Cooks here, Tahiti, um, and uh, the Marquesas here. This actually fits almost perfectly with the linguistic tree that we see here from Clark and 1976, where you generally have your Samoan outliers. Interestingly, Tonga, Tonga and Fiji are, are not part of the Samoan group. Um, so there's a bit of an issue there, but otherwise you see this separation of um, proto-Eastern Polynesian with, with Rapa Nui, the language of, of Easter Island. Um, they dropped out of this, this network, the central region. Um, and then we see a breakup of that with the Marquesic groups, the, the language of the Marquesas uh, and Mangareva here, um, and the proto tahitic group. So this is exactly what we would expect from the archaeology or from the linguistic evidence, um, and certainly from the archaeology where we see um, 
you know, evidence of significant interaction in the central uh, East Polynesian zone. Marquesas are slightly out of it and Rapa Nui further out. Note that Hawaii and, and New Zealand are not on this uh, part of this study, which is, is interesting and um, I think would, would mess up their nice little story, but uh, that's again, another, another story. So this is what they see. Um, what they reconstruct with their fancy new methodology for dating, um, and which surprisingly fits quite nicely with the radiocarbon evidence that we have uh, for archaeological for human expansion um, across East, East Polynesia. Um, but we also see this evidence of um, uh, error of direction and width in terms of the strength of the expansion statistics. So we see, not surprisingly, that Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, very strong links there. We also know that historically Samoa, Fiji, and Tonga were part of a uh, Polynesian chiefdom exchange. Um, uh, very well documented uh, interaction sphere here that also did feed into um, East Polynesia. So, you know, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes that we're now being told that the genomic data is finally answering this question that if you talk to any archaeologist is, is certainly not a question. Um, but what it doesn't take into consideration is what's happened after settlement um, in terms of history. And what we think it also does reflect is much more likely um, rather than settlement process and, and these rare alleles and so forth is the impact of um, the introduction of European diseases that resulted in massive depopulation. Interestingly, not in the Western, Western Polynesian populations or so much in the Cooks. You can see these are estimates of the impact of, of infectious disease, um, you know, did have a negative impact in these locations, but not nearly as significant as the, the extremes where Yonidas and all are seeing their isolation events and so forth. So Tahiti and Marquesas from tens of thousands down to maybe 10,000. Uh, in 1863, the Marquesas, um, you know, really wiped out from 20,000 down to, you know, just a few thousand. In some places like Rapa Nui, um, populations got as low as about 100, um, because in addition to the infectious diseases introduced by the first European voyagers, um, we also had a serious impact in, in many Polynesian archipelagos of blackbirding or slaving, um, where uh, you know, in, in Rapa Nui, for example, there was apparently about a 60% uh, population decline as a result of blackbirding and people being taken to, to um, Peru and Chile. Um, in places like uh, Tokelau, where we've been modeling um, the genetics of, of population history, um, all of the men were taken off of, um, for example, the island of, of um, uh, Atafu. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, significant demographic impact so that you're only dealing with a few hundred individuals um, at, you know, by the, the late 1800s on some of these islands. Um, the Yonidas uh, study um, sampled a wide range of these islands, but had very, very small sample sizes. Um, and it's not surprising that if you go back um, to the late 1800s, most of, you know, most of the people on the island particularly when you're masking non-Polynesian uh, genomic data um, would be very, very closely related and share um, those ancestors. So the study had small sample sizes, uh, their legacy samples, which is a whole nother issue, which we could discuss and debate, and their methods for analysis were somewhat questionable as well. They were using an ancestry array, not, not genome sequence, um, data, but uh, an ancestry array captured data that was designed for Latin American populations um, to which there was no specific uh, contribution to those uh, array designs. Um, but they, they do recognize the importance of full genome sequencing and they encouraged us to do, people to do that um, because as they point out, um, understanding the settlement of the Pacific um, is essential for medical research and, and really um, we've got to kind of come to grips with that, not in the way that they were doing it, I would argue. Um, so uh, so we're, we're now trying to do that. Uh, we have been trying to do this now for a few years. Um, this, uh, I was basically giving a seminar um, not long after I arrived at Otago uh, over in the biochemistry department about 
talking about Polynesian origins and the work that we were doing on commensal animals. And I met uh, Tony Merriman uh, after that seminar. And we started talking about you know, the data that we were generating and what he was seeing in his research on, um, on gout and metabolic disease and genomic evidence for that. So Tony and I started this collaboration. We were joined um, by an outstanding um, young student, uh, Anna Gosling, who did her PhD with us and is now working with us uh, on, on a major project um, investigating uh, genomic evidence for um, metabolic disease in the Pacific. So of course, metabolic disease, um, hyperuricemia is a common factor contributing to metabolic disease more broadly. Um, and we see in, um, in the data, the worldwide data, the highest rates of, of um, uh, mean serum urate levels are found uh, in uh, Micron Polynesians, and in particular East Polynesians, Micronesians, and Taiwanese and Island Southeast Asian populations. So um, this is the, the mean serum urate level here, and you can see that the red, which is Polynesian, um, the green, which is Micronesian, blue is Island Southeast Asian populations have the highest frequencies. Melanesian yellow um, populations, again, what is Melanesian? Um, these are, are remote oceanic, these are near oceanic. Melanesians um, are, are, uh, have lower, lower levels and varying degrees. And of course, what Tony's um, and, and his colleagues work uh, is showing is that there is uh, not only um, markers that um, are associated with metabolic disease that are uh, found at high frequency in the Pacific populations, um, some unique markers found in Pacific populations, but also variation in those um, genetic markers associated with me metabolic disease in the Pacific. And in particular, East Polynesian versus West Polynesian um, differences, which we see in the um, whole genome data that we, that we were collecting for um, our anthropological studies. Um, looking at trying to map um, human migrations. These people and individuals here, not surprisingly, when you go back and look at the genealogical information, have a parent who is from East Polynesia and a parent who is from West Polynesia. So, so when this led us to kind of really try to understand why do we see these patterns of metabolic disease in Pacific populations? Traditionally, it has been argued that it's modern lifestyles and, and eating uh, Western foods. But um, we also have arguments about thriftiness and driftiness, thrifty genes, thrift, thrifty genotype, thrifty phenotype, and the concept of drift voyaging, that you have selection for particular individuals during these long, difficult, dangerous voyages where people were dying at sea or dying when they arrived on an island because there was no food. Um, and therefore there was selection for individuals who uh, were more robust and, and so forth and had these um, genotypes and or phenotypes. But we see um, in the archeological record that there is evidence of gout and metabolic disease in the earliest ancient populations. The first people to arrive on these islands were suffering from, from gout. And we see that in the skeletal record. We see that they were suffering from um, from uh, metabolic disease generally, type two diabetes, we think, and characteristics in the skeletal record that we call DISH, diffuse is idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, hyper um, but uh, these characteristics of the vertebrae, and we see these, and these are from the, the first uh, Lapita people to arrive at Teuma and Vanuatu. So evidence of gout and metabolic disease in, in Aotearoa, in Hawaii, in Vanuatu, in, in um, the Mariana Islands. So it's not a, a disease of modern lifestyle. Um, and given what we've talked about voyaging and the lack of isolation, um, the reliability of, of, of relationships and interactions so that you know one island gets hit badly, as we see in tsunami and things, um, there are others that you're connected to socially. Um, so you're not isolated, you're not, um, yeah dying at sea and so forth. But we're trying to figure out what is causing the high rates of metabolic disease in the Pacific. Um, in order to do this, we've really got to understand and map that variation at the genomic level. Um, and so we are doing this with our colleagues and collaborators at the University of Guam and University of uh, Papua New Guinea, um, looking at the questions of ancestry and, and the range of ancestry, Austronesian versus non-Austronesian, Lapita versus non-Lapita, looking at, at the variation that we see at the mitochondrial level, and there's some interesting data coming out there, but also potentially looking at even more ancient ancestry um, in the Denisovans 
who uh, we see the highest level of Denisovan um, ancestry or admixture or, uh, genetic history in uh, Pacific people and in particular um, the people of, of New Guinea, but also um, further out into the Pacific. We're also looking at the possibility of selection um, and in particular looking at, at malaria, infectious disease, but also more broadly infectious diseases and trying to understand potentially it, that um, uh, infectious disease that was introduced by Europeans may have also contributed um, to, to uh, shape the genome of Pacific peoples. So um, say we've got a wonderful team of colleagues um, from, from Otago, from uh, Guam, from UPNG. Uh, we've got some fantastic new students who Tristan arrives on Sunday um, from Guam, finally, after his first year of his PhD, uh, doing that remotely. And Lisa Berry, who, um, who just joined us uh, as a PhD student at the beginning of this year, um, to try to understand this question. And so I will leave it at that. And hopefully there's some time for questions. <laughs> Well, kia ora. Thank you very much, Lisa, for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to hear about the work that you've led over a large number of years. Um, but thanks so much. My pleasure. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Enjoy the weekend.